Is everybody blessed this morning? All right, let's do that again. Is everybody blessed this morning? Amen. (laughs) All right, so today we're going to continue the series of stories of discipleship. And last week, uh, Pastor Ernie, how many of you guys remember the message from last week about counting the cost? You guys remember that? Do you guys understand what counting the cost means in discipleship? Many of us here have gone through discipleship, whether it's one-to-one or your life groups, and many of us have stories about discipleship. The, the great thing about coming here every morning and talking about these things is not only can we share our stories about discipleship, but we can also go into the Word because I think there's kind of this disconnect where we think, okay, this is what discipleship is all about in my time, in my cultural context, in my historical context, here in 2022 in Virginia. But how can I connect to the Word of God, which was written thousands of years ago by various authors? So that's what we're going to find out this morning, what the Bible says about discipleship. And I know that even at times, When it comes to our Christian faith, when it comes to just faith in general, more more oftentimes than not, we're called to rely on God who we can't see, we can't audibly hear. We rely on the Holy Spirit to fill the gaps in for us. Amen? When it comes to our faith, especially when things are not going the way that you want them to go, even when you're praying and things are going the opposite way. How many of you guys have prayed something and things have gone the opposite way? Raise your hand. Yeah, a lot of us, right? Now, does that mean that we give up on our faith? Does that mean that we falter or we waver in our faith? Does that, does that mean that we kind of have our faith take a back seat and we start to lean on our own understanding? Remember what Proverbs, sa- Pro- Proverbs 3 says, is to trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. In some, verse, in some translations, it says, submit to him all your ways, and he shall direct your paths. So when it comes to discipleship, when it comes to our faith, we are called as a people to submit to God. Sometimes we don't like that word, submit, right? It's, it's almost like a, like a tyrant. We have to submit to this tyrant or this ruler. Amen? Like, who likes that word submit? It's almost like you're helpless. You can't do anything. You, you just got to trust in the ruler. But let me tell you this. This morning when Princess came up here this morning as a worship team was leading us into worship, as Pastor Ernie was telling us about a good father, we don't just see him as God the ruler. We don't just see him as, as God the who is way out there, and we cannot have a relationship with him. We cannot pray to him. We cannot do these things to have an intimate relationship with God. But God is a God who's an intimate father that cares about the minute details in your life. Say amen if you understand me this morning. The very minute details in your life. Today we're going to speak on a topic of discipleship that builds and lasts. Turn to your neighbor and says and say, discipleship that builds and lasts. Building and lasting. If discipleship is at the forefront of all of our lives, then I believe that there would be one thing that is evident in a Christian's life. How many of you guys have been Christian here or been following Christ for more than a year? Raise your hand. A year. All right, how many five years? Raise your hand. How many ten years? Raise your hand. Pastor, you're not raising your hand. You're supposed to. <laughs> how many? 20 years, right? 20 years, all right, 30 years. Okay, after 50 years, you don't have to raise your hand. I just believe you. There's one thing that's very evident in a Christian's life when it comes to discipleship, and that one evidence is its fruit. A Christian is always going to bear fruit if discipleship is at the forefront. Now, let me tell you something else about discipleship. 
Something about discipleship that we underestimate is discipleship is all about relationships. Say to your neighbor, discipleship is all about relationships. Here you go. Here's a perfect example right here. You got Jed right here who's what, 27? 28. Give, give the Lord a hand of praise for Jed. And then he's discipling. And I see, I see Jed and Joe Mar discipling these younger men who are younger than them. Peter, how old are you? 14. You got a 28-year-old and a 14-year-old. And they, right there is an example of a relationship that's multi-general. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for discipleship. Jed, thank you so much for discipling that young man. And young man, Peter, I know there are times when you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to listen to what you have to say. But let me tell you, whatever Jed has gone through, or whatever you've gone through, Jed has gone through as well. So this is an, a perfect example of what relationship is all about, building relationship, building a Christian foundation that lasts. Now, God is the one that does the changing. We may have Jed whole plant and water the seeds, right? Amen? Every week, you're meeting up with Peter. You're meeting up with the Zachs. You're meeting up with the young men in our church right now, our youth. And some of the women here are meeting up with a younger woman. And they're planting and watering and planting and watering. And I remember the message uh, weeks ago when Joe Mar was talking about sometimes you just wish you... You want to give up on the person because you don't see any change. Amen? You don't see any change. But really, what happens is we're just planting and watering. We're planting seeds and we're watering that seed. We're planting seeds and we're watering that seed. We do not have anywhere in the equation where we change that person. Is that, is that, is that a shocker to you? We cannot change that person we're discipling. The one that does the changing is God himself. It is God himself that does the changing. And I know that may be a shocker. Man, I've, I've invested 50 hours in two weeks. Man, I, I can't imagine Pastor Ernie saying, man, this guy, I've been praying for this guy. I've been lecturing this guy about this and what it says and this. And he's still calling me at 2 in the morning crying, right? Pastor Ernie, you remember those days, right? You remember those nights, sleepless nights. It was almost like you had another son. That was right there. So sleepless nights, but it was, it, it was all about relationships. It was all about God changing me. God had to change my heart. It was never about Pastor Ernie changing my heart. He had no power to change my heart. He had no power to change me. I could do whatever. I had the freedom to do whatever I wanted. But it was God who changed me. So as God does the changing, the thing about Jesus and relationships, one thing is when the children come up to Jesus, you know, the, the first thing you notice is the disciples were kind of angry. Oh, man, all these kids, why are all these kids here? They're running around, they're coming, and they're, they're tugging at your garments. They're just all over the place. One thing about kids is they're innocent, but sometimes they just, they just do whatever they want, right? They run around, they do, they yell, they scream, uh, they'll jump on your lap, they'll jump on the chairs, and that's just how kids are. And the, the disciples, these, these young men were like, Jesus, let's just shoo them away. But Jesus was talking to the disciples, says, don't, let, don't, don't, don't shoo them away or don't get them out of my side, don't get them out of my presence. As a matter of fact, let them come to me. Let them come to me because it's a, it's a person who has this child's heart that shall inherit the kingdom of God. It's those who have a childlike heart. How in tune are we when it comes to discipleship? Is this something that we as a people, as life church, as family, are we taking discipleship as something serious, as something that we build upon? Last week, Pastor talked about counting the cost. Counting the cost of discipleship, meaning that there's going to be hours where you're going to be sitting in with this person who's going to be telling you about their life's problems, whether it's with their marriage, whether it's with their kids, whether it's with their coworkers, whether it's about their boss, whether it's the military, whether whatever it may be, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it may be, you're going to be sitting in and you're going to be listening 
to this person's challenges and problems, but how many of us are willing to invest the time in discipleship that builds, in discipleship that lasts, meaning that I'm willing to take root with you in discipleship in either teaching you the doctrines and and the foundations of, of God's word in scripture or me being discipled myself. There should be a relationship with every one of us, whether, number one, you've been discipled, whether one-to-one or someone is just there to talk to you about God, to pray for you. That should be one relationship. And the other relationship should be the relationship that says, well, these are the things I know about God, and I'm willing to spread them to the next generation. I'm willing to share my faith to the next generation. I'm willing to do one-to-one. It doesn't even have to be called one-to-one. I'm willing to invest my time with someone so I can pray for this person about who God is and about who God is in their life and what they're specifically going through. Now, the title of our message in my discourse this morning is simply Built for Discipleship. Turn to your neighbor and say, Built for Discipleship. Discipleship that is meant to last. Now, we've gone through weeks of what discipleship means, We've gone through weeks of encountering God. We've even went through weeks. Since last week, Pastor talked about counting the cost. What is counting the cost? When we count the cost, we know that going in, this is what I have to do. You know, before you sign, you guys have bought a house, right? Guys buy a car. When you sign a dotted line, you think to yourself, okay, I got to pay this much per month. Or I have to finance this much per month. Or I have to budget this much per month. You don't just sign that piece of paper and say, I'm going to get a new car. Because it's, it's a nice thing to do. And I have some money and I can go ahead and I, I have some, some uh, funds that I can go ahead and get a car or get a new house. You don't just sign the dotted line. you got to count the cost. Right? For those of you in the military, raise your hand. Or been in the military, raise your hand. When you sign that dotted line, did you count the cost? of deployments, of being away from your family, missing anniversaries, missing birthdays, missing soccer games, missing all these things. Did you count the cost? That is the cost of discipleship. And we go in and we have these relationships with the people that are in your lives. That is the cost. But how does that last? We're going to answer that question. How does this discipleship, how is building in Christ, in discipleship last. So here we turn to Matthew 19, 13 through 14. This is our first verse or first passage before we get into our main text. It says, Then the people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as to such as these now i want us to pay attention this morning because if there's something about children right especially if they're they're little kids you tell them hey you know little billy or you know sherry or whoever your your daughter or your son's name is we're gonna get some ice cream later or we're gonna go out and get some we're gonna go to a buffet we're gonna go to your favorite restaurant and that's all you gotta tell them you know, they don't question you. They just like, yay, we're going to go out. And we're gonna. As a matter of fact, we were watching a movie the other day on Disney. <laughs> a funny scene, right? So the, the older kids, the, the stepdad comes in, and he brings them, like, beats or a sweatshirt or a nice hat and all these things. And they're, like, happy. Yay, thank you, blah, blah, blah. And they leave the room. And so the little kids were there, the little children, maybe about from 5 to, to 10 or 11, something like that. So they're there, and they're expecting, Daddy, where are our gifts? And the kids are like, and the daddy, well, I don't have any gifts. I, I, I forgot about your gifts, this and this and that. And they're like, oh, they're all sad. And what happens is the, the dad takes out chocolates and soap from the hotel. <laughs> I kid you not. He takes them out, and he throws them on the bed. And I said, what kind of gifts what kind of dad would give their kids soap and chocolate? 
I mean, if, if, I, if I was a kid, I'd be like, what, what is this, Dad? You're giving me soap from the hotel and chocolate from the hotel? And they were just the happiest thing ever. I mean, they were so happy. They're like, yay, we got soap and chocolate. And they didn't question the dad. They, they were just like, they were just so happy. See, that's what kids are. Just in their nature, they're, they're willing to trust their moms. They're willing to trust their dads. When I see little Arya running around and I see her trusting Eli and Princess and just so happy, that's the good nature of kids. They don't ever question. They just say, all right, Dad, where are we going? All right, Mom, where are we going? But then as the kids get older, they start to ask why, right? Little Arya is going to start asking why in a couple of years. Why? why, Mommy? Why? Why do I have to do that? I remember when our kids never asked why, now they're like, why? Why this? Why, why that? And, and we answer those questions. And that's what it comes to discipleship, because in discipleship, as you're learning more about Christ, you're not asking why this, why that. You just believe and you just trust in what the Word of God says. Now, you may have doubts. You may have questions. And there's no question that's ever too big for God. There is no question. If you question scripture, if you question this about a certain passage, you can say, God, well, why is it this way? Help me understand. And like I mentioned earlier, it's the Holy Spirit that fills in the gaps. Now, in Acts 8, 25 through 40, this is our main text. And for many of us who have read this text about Philip, we may look at it as a text that talks about evangelism. And rightfully so. This is one of the texts I use when I teach about evangelism. This is it right here. I teach this from this text, Acts chapter 8, 25 through 40. But then you're asking, what does this have to do with discipleship? And we're going to dig deeper into why. Let's read. It says, So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem. They were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from the Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? Check out these two verses right here. Philip goes to him just rides up on a chariot, walks up beside him in a chariot, and he overhears him speaking about or reading out loud about the prophet Isaiah and what this means. Now, back in the day, when you're reading scripture, you read it out loud for memorization. In the ancient times, they would read it out loud. So here, Philip is hearing the reading of Isaiah. It would be weird to just kind of read the Bible silently. Back then, they read it aloud because it was a way to memorize scripture. So he's overhearing this eunuch who's not a Jew, first of all, who's not a Christian, and he reads Isaiah, and he asks him, do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch says, well, how could I unless someone guides me? How many of us have gone through one-to-one? We read scripture, and we had no idea what it meant. Raise your hand. I know I did, right? I would ask pastor, well, what does this mean? Can you guide me in this? Can you help me interpret this? Now, all of us here who have been exposed to scripture or read our Bibles, all of us here are all exegetes. You guys know what that means? Exegetes, those who draw out scripture and interpret scripture, not through our lens, because we have this 21st century or 22nd century lens and, and uh, 21st century lens here and now, but through their lenses in their historical context. We interpret scripture through their lens, not through our lens. You guys understand what I'm talking about? Say amen if you know what I'm talking about. And he's saying, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how, how could I? I? I don't even know what this scripture means. Can, 
can someone guide me? So it's almost like a hint to Philip. Can, hey, yo, can, can you help me with this? I don't, I don't understand anything I'm reading right now, but I'm willing to understand. And it says here, and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture, which he was reading, was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth in humiliation. His judgment was taken away. Who will, rel- who will, relate, his, who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say of this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, beginning from the scripture. He preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went up and down to the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at, at Azotus, and he passed through, he kept preaching, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for your word. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to each and every one of us. God, I pray that you would use me to proclaim your gospel and to talk about discipleship that lasts. So God, we just thank you right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So in this particular passage, we see a eunuch that's not even a Jew, has no background in in what has happened to to Jesus and the Messiah and and all these writings about the, the coming Messiah, who was Jesus, right? And he comes because he wants to know more about him. The great thing about it is this was a Gentile who, who was so interested, who wanted to know more about Jesus. And the spirit talks to Philip and says, go up to that chariot. So he decides, okay, I'm going to obey the angel first because of direction and the spirit of God who is leading me to this chariot. Now, Philip, being the Christian that he was, being nervous that he was, think about this. Here's Philip just being a a regular Jew disciple, and he's coming up to this official. It's not just a random guy at a Walmart or at Walgreens that you meet, but an official. So think about this as an official for the White House or an official at some high-ranking place, right? So he comes up, and he has the boldness to say, do you understand what you're reading? He challenges him. This is, this is one-to-one, one-on-one. He challenges him. Do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand what, strip, what Scripture is saying about Jesus? Do you understand what Scripture is saying about this particular Messiah? And he goes on to say, I, I don't understand. Can you, a hint, can you guide me in this? Fast forward, he gets excited, and he sees water, and he says, what's preventing me to get baptized? Can you baptize me? So it was, it's almost like campus ministry. Like, I know you're in campus ministry. You've seen miracles over there in Tennessee, and I, I guarantee you, just like when I went to uh, uh, Campus Harvest at, at, at UNC Chapel Hill. By the way, go Tar Heels, right? I don't know if there are any Tar Heel fans in here, but the Tar Heels... Um, we, we were, we were um, um, really uh, ministering to the people at UNC Chapel Hill. And as people received the gospel, as long as we had a bathtub, we would say, do you want to get baptized? You want to get baptized right now? And after that, the great thing is, do you want to receive the Holy Spirit into your life? It, it was just like a one and done shop. It wasn't like, okay, we're going to go through this program, this, this, and that. It was a one and done shop. And here we see Philip having the audacity, having, having the boldness to come up to this eunuch and saying, we are going to get you baptized and you are going to rely on God from here on out. That's, that is really discipleship 101. Point number one is this. Discipleship starts with preaching the gospel to others. Say that to your neighbor. Preach the gospel to others. Preach the gospel to others. Acts 8.25 says, so when they had solemnly testified, and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back 
to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. We don't know how long Peter, John, and Philip were preaching the gospel, but they were preaching it to everywhere they were going. When we're talking about discipleship, one of the things that I talk to people about is, are, are you sharing your faith? Are you sharing your faith with Christ? Whether it's with your cousins, whether it's with your friends, whether it's with your coworkers, whether whoever it may be, are you sharing your faith with others? Are you sharing your faith when you're in a grocery store? Are you sharing your faith when you're at the car wash and you're waiting for a car? Or you're waiting for a car to get your oil changed. Are you sharing your faith? Are we preaching the gospel to others? Many people have this misunderstanding in discipleship that we have to know all of Scripture. How do you guys believe that we have to know all of Scripture to share our faith? No one's raising their hands, right? No one. I saw one just like a little bleep over there. I don't know. But anyway, so no one here believes that we know all of Scripture to share our faith. And that's the misconception and the misunderstanding because we see at the garden, we see at the tomb that uh, Mary Magdalene, and we see also the Samaritan woman, they didn't know scripture, but yet they shared and preached the gospel. They shared their faith. Are we allowing our faith in Christ to let us live a life of boldness to share this faith? Are we sharing our faith? Are we taking it to the next level in our discipleship? Are we, are, are we doing so? And I know this is kind of a hard pill to swallow about sharing our faith. But we just have to look at Philip. We have to look at the disciples who are going from city to city and sharing their faith. Point number two, discipleship building puts his or her trust in the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8, 26 and 27, the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, telling him to get up and go south of the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then here, Philip gets up, and there the Ethiopian eunuch was there, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to, to, to Jerusalem to worship. The Holy Spirit is going to tell you things. He's going to share with you things most of the time that you may not want to do. The Holy Spirit will get you out of your comfort zone. I will tell you that right now. How many of you, the Holy Spirit told you something, it wasn't comfortable because you had to get out of your comfort zone? Raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's a shocking thing. Oh, Lord, you want me to go talk to that person that's work, currently working out right now? Or Lord, you want me to go to that person to the car and tell them that God, is, that God is with you, that God loves you, that God has great things for you? Well, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is always going to challenge you in your faith. The Holy Spirit is going to tell you, I want you to place your hands on that person's knee or that person's back or that person's arm or that person's head and pray for healing right now in the name of Jesus. And you're like, what? You, you want to use me to heal this person? I've never seen healing in my life. I've never done any healings for myself in my life. And he's saying, you either go or are you somebody else? And here we see that Philip goes. We see that Philip is challenged. We see the direction that God is giving Philip. There are many of us here that are asking God, God, where, where should I go in this faith? Where, where are you challenging me in my faith? Either sharing my faith, either going up to someone and and performing a healing because you've asked me, going to someone and proclaiming Christ. Two weeks ago, I, I talked about maybe some of you here are called into missions, long-term missions trips, where you're going to go to a place that are uh, either the 1040 window or unreached people groups. Unreached people groups are people that have not ever seen a Bible, heard the gospel, never heard about Jesus. Unreached people groups. There may be some of you here that are called to lifelong term missions. And God is going to call you. The Holy Spirit will lead you. And here the Holy Spirit is leading Philip. I want to tell a story real quick about 
two people I did one to one with I discipled. You guys may have known Rodney and, and Joe. Um, Rodney became my, uh, I guess, second hand man in campus ministry at ODU. And then Joe to now, I had the privilege of officiating my ever first wedding. But I remember one day as I was teaching him the, the foundations of Christ, I was teaching him about Christ, I was teaching him about uh, Jesus and the doctrines of, of the scripture. And he was growing, he was reading scripture on his own. And I remember him one day, he, he brought a couple of people to church. And I said, I was kind of shocked. And then, well, you brought some people to church, what, what, what made you bring? It was, it was, it was shocking to me because I didn't expect him at the time. But he said, man, the Holy Spirit told me to just speak to some individuals. I remember one time I said, the Holy Spirit told me to quit smoking. When we did our one-to-ones, I said, man, you can smoke all you go, go ahead and smoke. I didn't tell you, you got to quit smoking because that's what God is. No, I just, I just let the Holy Spirit speak to him. I said, this is how the Holy Spirit will speak. He is the person, he is the agent that convicts mankind of his sins. And I let the Holy Spirit speak to him. One day he came and he no longer, he, he no longer smoked anymore because he told me, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I didn't, I didn't need to smoke, to smoke anymore to get to where I want to go in life or to, to handle my stress or to handle these things. The Holy Spirit is the agent that will tell you of where we need to go and why we need to put our trust to him. And this is the last point. Discipleship building asks questions that lead the person to Jesus. In Acts 8, 29, 31, 34 through 37, then the Spirit said to Philip, go up to this chariot. Philip ran up, heard him saying, reading from Isaiah the prophet, and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I, unless someone guides me? We talked about this. Every question that people ask, whether it's at your workplace, whether it's at your home, whether it's your loved one, whether the person is in the last minutes or seconds of his life, the person is going to ask you about your faith. About, and, and that is where your discipleship is really founded in, in Christ. And what do you have to say to this person? Every question that any, any person will ask of you in your faith should lead to Jesus. Every question. All the solution, the only answer to all of mankind's problems, challenges, doubts, and fears, the answer has always been Jesus. And we see Philip here, and he guides this person, this eunuch, to Jesus. Now, if we're really serious about discipleship, if we're really serious about our faith, when, we talk, when, when, I, when I talked about Jed earlier, Man, I'm just so inspired. It kind of reminded me of a younger me back then, right? Yeah, younger me. And man, just discipling and, and just spending time with, with the young men, spending time with individuals who want to know about Christ, who are thirsty for Christ. Now, you can't control someone's thirst for Christ. You can't. Either the person's thirsty for God or they're not. There's no in-between, like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little thirsty for God, but I'm not really because I'm busy with other things. With Jesus, remember how Pastor and I, we talk about Jesus was never impressed with the crowds. He never was. To us, maybe pastors, maybe for, for many uh, people here in America where church has become uh, a consumer, a uh, Something of consumerism where, where everything is all about what is it in it for me. If I was a pastor that cared about attendance, I would, I would be so discouraged. Man, I see empty seats everywhere. We got to fill these seats up. You know what? We need to get someone in. We need to get Hillsong in here. We need to pay them. We need to have a concert. And we need to have people come to Christ because this concert is going to be a blast. But you see, Jesus didn't care about who's sitting in these seats. Who's, as a matter of fact, he said, if you could take this teaching, then you stay. But if not, then you can go. He said that. Jesus said, you, you, you don't have to stay. If you can't eat of the bread, if you can't drink of this cup, 
you, and you can't take this teaching, you don't have to stay. He was never impressed with the crowds. He was never impressed with how many people say, hey, I'm here in church, that's a checklist, and I'm here, I'm present. What Jesus was really looking at was this. You're either in it or you're out. There, there's no in between. You're either for discipleship, you're either willing to get discipled, you're either willing to grow in your faith, or you're not. There's no in-between. Yet, there are stages of our journey that God is going to bring us. And even if you're in a stage where you're still new to the faith, that's great. Keep at it. And if you're older in the faith, that's great too. But one thing I want to encourage is this. Keep at your faith. Build at your faith. Get discipleship. Do one-to-one. Join life groups. I know we say this, we talk about our pillars of our faith, whether it's discipleship, whether it's prayer, whether it's evangelism, whether it's lordship, whether it's family. We talk about the pillars of our faith, the core values of this church. But let's do it, guys. As a church family, let's do it. What's preventing you from doing one-to-ones? What's preventing you from joining life groups? What's preventing you, just like this eunuch who said, hey, there's water over there. Can I get baptized? What is preventing us? And we can't say we're too busy. We can't say, I got so much things to do at work. I got so much things to do with our family. Because really, our growth in Christ hinges on this. How much of a foundation have we built in Christ? Let's go ahead and stand right now to our feet. God, I thank you, Lord, that you are speaking to us. I thank you, Lord, that you are good. And God, there are times when we feel like we may not be growing, we feel like we're not building on discipleship. God, I'm asking of you right now in the name of Jesus that you speak to our very hearts about our discipleship journey, that you're building on our discipleship, that you're putting in us, you're instilling in us love and hope, God, right now I pray for every single person who's in this place, whether they've been to this church for many years or maybe this is the first time they've ever visited. God, I'm praying that you're speaking to our hearts right now. Thank you for where you've guided us. Thank you, Lord God, for where you're going to guide us in the future. So right now, like every head bowed and all eyes closed. And I want to pray for you where you're at. Father, I know without a shadow of a doubt that you want to grow our faith. And sometimes in life, many things get in the way, whether it's our work, our careers, our families, whether it's situations, whatever it may be, Lord, God, I ask that you help us, that you dig deeper in our hearts. And Father, you want to grow us. You want to build discipleship that lasts. You want to build on the legacy of your disciples, your legacy here on earth. And Father, you know the people's hearts right now in this room, in this auditorium. Lord, I cannot see their hearts, but Lord, you do. You see every single heart in this place with all heads bowed and all eyes closed. I'm going to do one call right now. And there's no shame. You you don't have to be shameful because you know that God is asking you to build on his legacy, to build on discipleship. If that's you right now and you're saying, God, you know, maybe I've never done a one-to-one or I've never... Uh, even come to you and, and take an interest at this point in my life because there's so many things that is going on, whether it's my job or my workplace, whether it's things in my life that's personal, whether it's just whatever what's going on on this earth, whatever that's going on in this country, there are many things. And right now, you're asking God, God, I want to have an interest in you. I want to build on discipleship. I want to be the one that will last. All my friends, when, 
when the storms come through their lives, they're going to panic. They won't know what to do. But God, even when the storms hit in my life, I'm going to know what to do because my foundation is you. If that's you right now, you're saying, God, I want you with all that I have, with all my heart. I want you to be the center of my life. If that's you right now, just raise your hand. There's no sham. I'm going to pray for you. Raise it high. It doesn't matter about the person next to you. Just raise it high. Just say, God, I'm here. God, I want you. God, I need you. God, I'm desperate for you. Just like this eunuch who, who's not even a Jew, who doesn't even know much, who didn't know much about Jesus at the time while he was reading scripture about the prophet Isaiah and, and, and really proclaiming Christ, really talking about the upcoming Messiah. If that's you right now, you say, I want to be like Philip. I want to be like this eunuch, and I want to learn more. I want, I want to thirst for more of you. I'm so hungry for you. I need you in my life. Raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you where you're at. God, I pray for these hands that are raised. And God, I ask right now, in the name of Jesus, for these hands that are raised, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would keep them. I pray, O oh Lord, even that you would help us, that you would increase our faith in you. And God, just like Philip and just like the eunuch, oh God, I pray that we would build on the foundation that lasts forever. That even as the storms come, even when the storms hit, you're always there to help us. God, I thank you so much for these men and women. Father, I thank you so much that you're doing a great thing in their lives. And God, I pray even that they would not lose hope in you, that they always have faith, that they always be steadfast in everything they do. In Jesus' name. Go ahead and put your hands down. I want to make one final call. This is the most important call of the service. If you've never received Christ, Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and I mean it like this, maybe you've come to church and you've thought that, hey, I'm a Christian but you've never fully received Christ into your heart. And what that truly means is this, is that Jesus came to this world. He was the only man to live a perfect life. He was the only man to become the ransom for our sins. The only person on this earth to bear the full weight of the wrath of God. Just think about it. The wrath, the entire wrath of God. And God the Father just put the, full, the, the fullness of his wrath upon his son so that we can be reconciled to him. I don't know a better gift than that, that knowing that if I die today, if I got in a car accident today, I know where my eternal, my eternal destiny is. I know where I'm going. I know that I'll be with Jesus. I know I'll be with God the Father. And maybe we've just been going to church. Maybe we've just been attending and not really having a personal relationship with God. And what a personal relationship with God is, talking to him every day, presenting your, your issues, presenting every wart that is going on in your life. God wants it all, all of it, not just some of it, not just a little bit of it, and not even 99.999%. He wants 100% of your heart. Maybe you haven't received Christ, but maybe there are some of us here who either have been just going to church, have accepted Christ in the past, but maybe you've strayed away. You're saying, God, I need you right now. God, I want you. God, I need you in my life. All heads bowed and all eyes closed. If that's you right now, I want to pray for you. Just lift up your hand really high. It doesn't matter about the person next to you. I'm going to pray for you where you're at. Father, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you that you are always good. And Lord, I thank you for the hands that are raised. I thank you for those who are coming back to you. And Lord, I even pray, God, that as we build upon discipleship, upon the legacy that you have for us, Lord, I know that you're going to do a mighty work in each person. And every person in here, God, I pray that you would give them favor in all they do. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Now, before I want to give the benediction. Before you give the benediction, Pastor Jay, 
Um, I'd like to call, I want to officially announce Missions 2022 in the month of August. Come on. It's still open for anybody that would like to come, but I'd like to call the people that have, the Lord has spoke to them and says, look, I want to join the missions team in August. Can you come up here, missions team? All right, this is the team, but we're still open. If you still want to join, please come and join us. We're meeting today at about 3 or 3.30 or 4 uh, at the center. Come on, give God a big hand for them. It's going to be a fun team. If you want to come, if you're interested, talk to me later. Talk to me later. Talk to us later. Now, how many enjoyed the service today? How many enjoy the Lord? If you feel that before leaving and going to your car, and you, you feel that you want a hand on your shoulder to lift you up in prayer, We're willing to pray for you at that corner. Would you go to that corner? Because sometimes the Bible says that you need a friend to lift you up and encourage you. We're willing to pray for you. So don't leave. If that's you, could you meet us at the corner and our team will pray for you. God bless. Pastor Jay. All right. Let's go ahead and raise our hands as a sign of surrender. God, you are so good in this place. Let's go ahead and praise him right now. Let's just give him praise. Give him honor. Give him all that we have. Let's worship him in this place. Father, as we raise our hands, God, I pray that your favor would be upon your people. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would always give them everything that they ever need, God. Father, I pray that they would never lack Holy Spirit, I pray that you give them the very power to embolden their faith. And Lord, I pray for healing. I pray, Lord God, that you are a generous God, that you are so generous to us, that you would want us to be generous to others as well. And so, God, I thank you so much for all you do in Jesus' mighty name. And all the saints of God said, amen and amen. Like Pastor Ernie said, if you need prayer, please come here. We love to pray for you. Service has ended. Uh, we'll see you guys in your life groups, one-to-ones, and service next week. God bless.